Hi again, I'm Steve Handelman of the Center on Media, Crime and Justice at John Jay College. Welcome to the second part of our series on bail reform and its implications in New York and elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, quite a lineup of speakers for you and a full house uh, of attendees who've signed up. Thank you all for joining us. We are going to be going till about 4 p.m. Uh, today we have two panels in line, both stimulating. Um, we are especially honored to start off with a keynote uh, speaker with the Honorable Jonathan Lippman, who for most of you really needs no introduction. He served as Chief Judge of the State of New York and Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals uh, from February 2009 through December 2015. But his retirement uh, from the bench uh, did not stop his active work in uh, judicial issues. Uh, while he was on um, his tenure as the Chief Judge, among his achievements, he championed equal access to justice issues in New York and around the country. He, uh, he made New York the first state in the country to require 50 hours of law-related pro bono work uh, prior to bar admission. He strengthened the state's indigent criminal defense system. He addressed the systemic causes of wrongful convictions, created human trafficking courts across New York State, and he led efforts to reform New York's juvenile justice system. So that's quite a basket of achievements. Um, he's also been deeply involved in bail and pretrial reform, which is what he's going to be talking about today. And uh, latterly, we're also going to discuss some of his work that he's done uh, on the Rikers Island jail facilities. As you know, he's been chairman of the 27-person uh, Blue Ribbon Commission that was uh, formed recently to examine the future of the island uh, jail. Um, so let me, without further ado, hand the gavel over to Judge Lippman, who'll speak for about 20 minutes or 25 minutes. I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll throw it open to Q&A from the rest of you. Uh, Judge, welcome. Okay, thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. And uh, um, it's great to be with such a distinguished group. I want to thank uh, Maurice for inviting me, and to all of you for participating on this important subject. So bail reform is a subject that is near and dear to me, uh, going back to a time when it was not the flavor of the day for criminal justice reformers and not a subject that was very much discussed at all in New York or nationally. To me as chief judge, bail was about equal justice. And I thought about how to achieve equal justice every day, not only in terms of the individual cases that came before the Court of Appeals, but more broadly in terms of the laws and practices that prevail in our state courts. The ideal of equal justice is at the core, core of what our court system and indeed our society ought to achieve. This is true in criminal law and in civil law. And too often we fail to live up to this ideal of equal justice in our courts as well as in our society. The challenge is, how can we make justice about fairness and the rights and liberties of individuals and not about the amount of money in your pocket or the color of your skin? In criminal law, as a practical matter, much is determined by money. The social, cultural, and economic factors that may lead someone to interaction with law enforcement the resources that an accused person, particularly black and brown persons, can put into fighting the charges against them. Cash bail is one of the most egregious examples of a system that too often punishes people of color and people of limited resources just for being poor. Almost a decade ago, as chief judge, I, thought I sought to use my unique pulpit as the steward of the justice system in New York and being in a position of moral leadership to persuade the legislature to change New York's laws on pre-trial release. Those of you who are familiar with Albany or have covered Albany know that this was not as easy as it might sound. So after two years, when we can no longer wait for the legislature to take action, I sought to, I, I sought to work within the then existing laws by using administrative measures to promote a court framework that encouraged judges to release more people on recognizance, impose lower bails 
so that people charged with crimes could wait for trial at home or use other alternatives to bail. Many rank and file judges resisted this initiative, but I felt a moral imperative to do what I could in this regard, recognizing the danger that by so doing, I would be labeled an activist judge, heaven forbid. I preferred to view it as being a judge that was proactive in the pursuit of justice. And to me, these are very different things. As they say, justice reform is not for the short-winded. I'm proud of what we accomplished during my tenure as chief judge, but it was not always easy, nor was it sufficient without being able to enact fundamental changes to the law itself, to the statutory framework. Judges are not legislators, nor should we be, but we can and should advocate for being justice, for justice system reforms that make the abstract concept of justice real and concrete for all of our citizens, black and white, rich and poor alike. So when it comes to so much of the focus of the discussion today, the bail reform passed last year in Albany. Let me begin by saying it was and is absolutely necessary. Our justice system has too often violated the principles of equal justice, not to mention the principle of innocent until proven guilty by imposing bail that people could not begin to pay for no fault of their own, putting them in jail for months and often years. This has been an especially heavy burden on people of color, particularly black people, who are disproportionately arrested, charged, and brought before the courts. If you can't make bail right away, you end up in jail, period. In New York City, that usually means Rikers Island, brutally violent, dangerous, inhumane, and without doubt, an accelerator of human misery, an abomination. Irrespective of the violence and inhumanity, there are profound consequences to spending even just a few days in a place like Rikers, losing a job, education, reputation, housing, custody of children. Studies have found that send, sending someone to jail for even a short period, a very short period, makes it more likely that they will return to jail in the future. The definition of a perverse outcome. Some people are able to find the money to pay bail after a few days or a week, usually with help from their families. But people who are held on bail often stay much longer than one or two days. In New York City, the average time to resolve a felony case before COVID was almost a year, twice as long as the rest of the state. If someone chooses to go to trial, the timeline is even worse. According to a study last year from the Independent Budget Office, for indicted New York City felony cases, acquittals take a median of 623 days and cases are dismissed only after a median of 583 days. So people held on bail have a terrible choice. Plead guilty and possibly go home, or stay for months and years at Rikers and fight their case like Khalif Browder did with its tragic consequence for a human being, in this case really a child, who was 16 years old when he was arrested. That's why 95% of cases end in a plea deal. Khalif Browder refused to take a plea, pro proclaimed his innocence, and we all know the price he paid for standing his ground. Race pay plays a big part in the ability to pay bail. A quarter of all African-American families would have less than $5 if they liquidated all of their assets. assets. In Brooklyn, 53% of Latino households and 50% of black households lack enough assets to, assets to meet basic needs during the financial crisis. For white households, it's 29%. Given these racial disparities, 
The impact of cash bail on families of color is particularly harsh and shameful. Even if people come up with the bail, the money is held by the courts until the case is resolved, inaccessible during that time. In many cases, detained people and their families turn to bail bondsmen who required cash or property as collateral and imposed large fees. According to City Controller Scott Stringer, each year, bondsmen in New York received up to $27 million in non-refundable payments, mostly from people of color who could not afford it. This is a remarkable wealth transfer. Money no longer available for essential expenses like childcare, food, rent, or transportation. And even worse and more shameful, from then on, the decision about a person's liberty was being made not by the prosecutor, not by the defense attorney, not by the judge, but rather by the bail bondsman, whose only interest was making money, a money-making institution really deciding on people's liberty. Thus, cash bail, to say the least, aggravates the pressure on an accused person to plead guilty. There is also a massive cost to taxpayers. The cost of jailing people who can't afford bail, over $1 billion each year in New York City alone. When bail reform was enacted, Rikers cost over $400,000 per person per year. Today, it is about $500,000 per person per year. There are strong alternatives to incarceration options in New York City and around the state, like supervised release. Even before bail reform first took effect in January 2020, judges were increasingly using supervised release to ensure people were safely released and actually returned to court. The success of these programs was and is powerful evidence that in most cases, we do not need bail to ensure that someone returns to court. Data around the country tells us 90% or more of defendants return to court for their appearances with or without bail. In New York City, from 2016 through mid-March 2020, people in the supervised release program attended 95% of all required court dates. And to their great credit, in my view, in April 2019, the state legislature passed a package of pretrial reforms that ended the use of cash bail in a large set of criminal cases in New York. The bail law, which went into effect in January 2020, requires that people charged with most misdemeanor and nonviolent felony offenses be released before trial. Although judges could order supervision programs to ensure people return to court. If someone fails to, appeal, uh, fails to appear for hearings, or was charged with a second felony, they could be detained. For event, offenses involving serious violence, cash bail and pretrial detention remain options. Judges are required to set partially secured or unsecured bond as alternatives to jail. Crucially, in cases in which bail is permissible, typically those defined under statute as violent offenses, judges are required to, the, to consider the accused person's ability to pay when determining if bail is appropriate, and if so, the amount of bail. Over a few months span, spanning just before and after implementation of bail reform, pretrial jail popula populations across the state declined by over one third. And what could be better than having less human beings being sent to horrible places like Rikers Island that are a stain on the soul of our city and our country? In my view, the bail reform legislation was and is a real and genuine success. To me, that success is because this whole issue is simple. 
if you are violent and hurt somebody, we can lock you up if necessary to protect other human beings. But if not, we keep you home in your job and with your family and your community. It is that simple. And that's what bail reform does. Yet, it is certainly controversial, which explains why you are discussing it here today. Changes in criminal law and the criminal justice process are always controversial, controversial because they strike a deep-seated concern. The right to be safe, the right to be free from unjust enrichment, the role of government in our society, the impact of the criminal justice on criminal of criminal justice on people of color, and the tremendous disparities of race and class that exist at every level of the justice system. The most high profile criminal cases usually involve events that prompt deep emotional reactions within us, which as journalists, you are keenly aware. Lives are often implicated, victims, accused persons, and their families. Criminal law and procedure also involve a degree of complexity that is often difficult for trained lawyers to fully grasp, let alone members of the public. Of course, I doubt that's a great problem for any of the esteemed members of the press in our audience. But still, where do you draw the line? How do you balance the risks? In what direction should we err? Take, for instance, the fact that in New York City, 50% of all arrests for offenses that are categorized as violent end up with the case dismissed or the person acquitted. But the accusations often sound terrible at the outset of cases. This is complex stuff for all of us, judges included. This level of controversy, complexity, and emotional resonance means that the work you do as journalists covering criminal justice is so particularly important. Bail, bail reform is such a striking example. In the case of bail reform, even before the law took effect, the backlash was swift and furious. Many of the reform's opponents predicted disaster. Blood on the streets. The media picked up the drumbeat. Daily headlines across the state, at times digging deeper, would have revealed more to the story, such as the accused person who was supposedly released because of bail reform was actually eligible for bail, but the judge chose not to impose bail. Or the accused person could have been held on a parole warrant, but was not due to a system error. Instead, the reforms were blamed. The legislature came under tremendous pressure to pull back the reforms and particularly to give judges more discretion to keep people in jail. I have long been a proponent of discretion for judges when it comes to pretrial detention. That's what judges are there for. But I was so disappointed at the level of vitriol and sensationalism in the attacks on bail reform and the hypocrisy, the absolute hypocrisy of those who all of a sudden became advocates for more judicial discretion after years of bashing judges for their decisions on bail. By any standard, the three months from January to March 2020 were far too few to tell what impact the reforms were having on crime or on plea rates. In addition, money was needed to invest in robust pretrial alternatives, especially outside New York City, but none was provided by the state. In April 2020, in response to this opposition, the legislature and the governor made some changes. They gave judges more discretion to jail people pre-trial on bail. The key changes, an expanded list of charges and situations now bail eligible, especially involving nonviolent felony. More options for ordering non-monetary release conditions, like mandated treatment, keeping a job, or staying in school. It is important to emphasize that these amendments did not mandate that anyone be incarcerated. Instead, they gave judges discretion to impose bail in a subset of cases. Again, to me, judicial discretion is a good thing. 
and new laws can always be refined and improved as long as it's based on experience and data and not on false hysteria or political posturing. The Center for Court Innovation predicted a rise in the New York City jail population of 16% due to the April 2020 amendment. I am not at all sure that that will be the case. Too early to tell. Coronavirus makes it rather impossible to yet discern the true impact. Of course, the true impact of these reforms also will be greatly determined by the actions of sy systemic players like judges and prosecutors. There will always be a risk, whether under the old cash bail system or the bail reform legislation, that someone who is released before trial or who pays bail will do wrong. But we also have to count, account for the very real risk that someone will be locked up unnecessarily with all of its harmful life consequences. This will never be an easy calculus for legislators fashioning the laws or for judges applying those laws to the individual human beings before them. In the past, however, the criminal justice system, and perhaps the media as well, has in my view focused too much on the risks of release rather than the risks and harms of too much incarceration. The Rikers Commission that I headed and so many others have documented the tragic consequences of the mass incarceration model to human beings and to our society and to our democracy. Looking forward, it is now time to make the bail reform laws that we have work so that we can move closer to realizing the promise of equal justice. This will involve training for judges, DAs and lawyers across the state on the operations of the new laws. The courts can develop methodologies for assessing people's ability to pay. So when bail is set, it is not set at levels that are un unaffordable burdens on accused people and their families. I believe strongly that we should also encourage judges to seek pretrial release as often as possible, consistent with public safety, helping us move, move towards a day when we end forever the perception and or the reality of a system of justice that is stacked against the poor and people of color. And if we need to make more changes, further changes in the bail statute, we can safely do it, but only after careful deliberation and based on the data and a weighing of societal benefit. We also want to take a close look at other laws that keep people incarcerated. For example, the laws governing people on parole who can be automatically incarcerated when accused of new crimes, no matter how serious, or a minor non-criminal technical violation without the opportunity for a judge to release them or even to set bail. The Less Is More Act, which is pending in Albany, would dramatically improve the situation and save the city and state hundreds of millions of dollars in unnecessary incarceration costs in the process. As journalists, I ask you to study these issues carefully and to report on them with great diligence. Cover them with the attention and care that they deserve. Pay attention to the lived experiences of those who are impacted by the laws and to a close examination of the data about their impact. Report on what is really going on rather than only the simplistic talking points of those on both sides of the equation with an agenda who have lost all perspective and cannot and will not see the forest from the trees. Of course, since you're all attending this session, I know I am preaching to the choir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um Judge Lippman, for a truly comprehensive um, start to our conversation. So let me start off our conversation, then then um, throw it open to Q and A, uh, with a couple of questions. Uh, you know, you you mentioned, of course, the backlash, and if if the uh, 
that reform was controversial uh, when the law was first um, tabled and then the amendment was passed. It's certainly uh, run into more headwinds, or the idea of bail reform has run into more headwinds since as we enter an um, election cycle, which is um, appears to be going in the opposite direction. It worries about law and order and rising crime and uh, I don't have to repeat, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, should we now worry uh, about whether we're going to go backwards and th the headwinds are going to be too much that we're just, no matter how many times we amend this law, that, you know, it's going to be impossible to reconcile the complaints of police and victims' rights groups um, and others, particularly upstate in New York and elsewhere in the country, uh, that, you know, bail reform is just a bridge too far, that, um, I mean, is there a way to cement the, 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 the principles that you just established uh, in law and in legislation so that we don't have to worry about going backwards? Well, in my view, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think that in addition to all of the uh, talk and legitimate talk about public safety and, and all of that, I think there's also been a, a uh, um, sensitizing of people to issues of racial justice, uh, police misconduct, um, you know, all the issues that we talk about in criminal justice reform. So I, I see, at least in the, the polling data that I've seen, that the majority of the public uh, understands that and is getting it as they never got it before. So I think that um, we're going along the right uh, road. I think the the new reforms have been good, and as I said, as I indicated, a great success, but I think that experience tells us where to go in the future, and uh, exactly what I was saying in my, my remarks, that, that as long as we look at it straight on, and don't, don't get into these people with a bit in their teeth who are not even thinking about what it's all about, um, as long as we do that, we look at our experience, we make uh, appropriate uh, uh, reforms and modifications if we need to. But I know from batting my head against the wall for a decade before we actually got bail reform, that criminal justice takes time for people to digest. This national discussion on racial justice has helped people to digest it and start to think about it more. One example, perhaps, of the backlash or something is the recent decision by a judge in Manhattan to block construction of the Manhattan jail, which is part of something you've been working on as alternatives to um, the Rikers Island. Um, how does that figure into your ideas that we may, um, we're on the way to real change if we're still seeing those kinds of reactions? Oh, I think we're well on the road. I think that that decision by the judge, and I'm the last person in the world to be criticizing judges for the decision, uh, was based on technical grounds. And I think, I know that the city is appealing. I know that they are moving forward uh, despite the decision. I believe they'll have a, a stay of that decision. And I think there are all kinds of technical issues relating to the design build concept which is very much what we use in terms of these new local jails. So I'm not deterred at all. I think, again, I view that as a technical decision and the city is committed to moving forward. And I don't think this is going to slow it down at all. And it'll be appealed as it should be and go through and take its normal course. Okay, I know there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, bail reform in the uh, question asked for free, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit, ask you another question. Um, Sure. You know, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg has triggered a fierce partisan fight about replacing her on the court. I don't want to get into the politics of it, but it's certainly added more fuel to the debate about the role and function of the Supreme Court itself. Um, you know, the Atlantic magazine recently called this a dangerous moment for the Supreme Court, perhaps the most dangerous moment. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you're, you talked about activist judges, you talked about the issues uh, relating to reform. Um, as they relate to judiciary issues on the bench. I wonder what your take is on whether the Supreme Court really is in bad need of reform or you know, should we just have to weather the current storm as one of so many others that we've seen before in American history? Uh, for me, basically the latter. I think the Supreme Court is a resilient institution. As someone who is um, 
going all over the world uh, talking about our justice system, about the Supreme Court, as someone who has stood up in China and had them criticize the U.S. Supreme Court over uh, uh, Gore versus Bush um, and all of that, um, it's resilient. There are, it's been an ebb and flow. There's a conservative court, there's a liberal court, but I have confidence in judges. And I believe at the highest level that in the end, judges do what the law dictates that they do. So I'm not at all uh, down about it. I understand, look, no one admired Ruth Bader Ginsburg more than I did. I had the privilege of uh, breaking bread with her and meeting her on many occasions. Um, and she was one of the giants of the legal profession, despite her uh, short physical stature, uh, an absolute giant. And, and I think there are so many towering figures uh, in the United States and the Supreme Court is a great institution. Um, I think that look what's happened over this last period when things were predicting everything and anything. And it didn't quite turn out the way everyone had suggested because judges are judges. And they're not politicians. As Robert said, Judge Roberts, Chief Judge Roberts, we're, 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 you know, we're not the Obama or Bush judges or Trump. That's not what we do. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of the Supreme Court, and it stood as well all these years. Do you think, uh, just a quick question here, do you think increasing the size, uh, some people have mentioned, to 11 uh, would get us out of the prison? My view is it's not the craziest idea in the world, but everything being equal, um, it would be better if that wasn't the case. Remember Roosevelt packing the court and all of that. So it would be preferable in less circumstance dictate some radical change to keep, again, an institution that served us so well in its present form. Okay, so let's move to questions. Um, um, Michael uh, Gelb is handling questions. Have you got any questions yet coming in? We welcome uh, just post your questions in the Q&A section and Michael will um, identify them and then identify you and ask the questions while we're waiting. Um, Judge, just following up on the question back to bail reform um, and the other issues that are pending in the New York State Legislature and elsewhere, one of the, the themes of this webinar session is where do we go next? Um, how do we make bail reform successful, if possible, without doing other key reforms in the justice system that uh, make bail reform real and useful. Um, you mentioned some, um, and I, I guess my question to you is, can bail reform really be successful without those alternatives? I, I think that the key to this is education, training, and looking at the data and the impact on human beings. I, I want, you know, when I said that I think we can always modify uh, um, uh, make amendments to different reforms. I don't think you ought to do it every other week. And I think that that we've had a reform, we've had some amendments. As I said to you, I'm a big admirer of judicial discretion. I've fought for it my whole life. There's a balance to where we go with all of this. But I think that I wouldn't tinker with the bail right now until we really get a sense that as we indicated in COVID, it's so difficult to figure out what in the world is going on. But I don't see, and I don't see any data based on the latest figures that show any great connection to, or any connection period, between bail reform and, and public safety. And I think we've got to study this and look at that. So my view is, let's make what we have work. As always, if there are things that need to be changed, we'll do it. And I think we have to consider Again, the two sides of this, treating human beings with respect and dignity, don't keep people incarcerated with the tragic consequences of comfort from it if it's not necessary, and at the same time, ensure that there's public safety. I think we can do both. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, we have a question, I think. Uh, Michael, can you? Yes. I can read it, it's from Barry Mahoney. Uh, I'll read the question to you. To what extent do you think it will become feasible to extend the principle of not imposing financial obligations that a defendant cannot pay from bail to the imposition of fines and fees for participating in supervision programs? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very much, I think it's a good question. Um, I, I am very much against the fines and fees in general. You know, there was a time that, that people around the country were saying that we should increase fines and fees so that the court systems can have money, so that you, you, you uh, uh, open up with one door access to justice and you close it with another. And I think it's the same principle on fines and fees for, uh, uh, for different programs. I think we do everything human po humanly possible to avoid that. I think it's counterproductive. It's against everything we're trying to do with bail reform. And, and I think that that's a, a, a problem that we ought to avoid. We have another question, Michael, can you read it? Yes, um, one attendee uh, wants to ask, um, reports are showing pre-trial detention has increased across New York State in recent months. Uh, Judge, what is your take on this trend in conjunction, in conjunction with the tweaks to bail reform? I, you know, I think my view is that it's so hard to figure out what's going on. I don't, I didn't give any of the data uh, uh, today uh, that much uh, uh, cognizance because I, I, I just don't have a clear pattern. Uh, uh, my belief, again, is that, that the bail laws, um, uh, you know, haven't resulted in more crime and, and, and people being uh, hurt. And on the other hand, um, I, don't, I don't see, uh, I hear you that there's been a, 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 that some of the data shows more pretrial detention, but I think it's so episodic at this point. I would like to, God willing, uh, come this uh, spring, we're going to get back to a more uh, normal criminal justice system, if, if there is such a thing, and that um, I think we'll get a better sense with DAs and defense attorneys and judges and court administrators can take a look at what's going on and have a better sense. I don't, again, it's hard for me to draw conclusions as to what the bail laws, what the modifications of bail laws, what the present uh, unrest in terms of the protests around the, uh, uh, the state and the country have, have all contributed to what's, what's going on. The, the, um, the police budgets, all of these things have to be put together. And that's what I mean about studying the data, not in a way that's about people getting on their high horses in one direction or another, looking at data, looking at human beings, and finding that balance that I talked about between uh, um, people staying out of these miserable places and yet ensuring that we have public safety. I think we can find it, but I don't see uh, trends right now that lead me in any particular direction. I wanna, I wanna get through with this COVID, uh, get some more experience with the new legislation, uh, get to some sense of normalcy. And then if we need further changes, we'll go out and do what we have to do. And, and I think all of us play a role in that. There's a dialogue that has to include. And I think that's been some of the, uh, um, the lessons that we've learned that everyone has to be consulted in all of this. You know, I look parochially from the judicial branch. I believe the judges who may be closer to this than anybody else and have a neutral perspective are not consulted enough. So I think we all have to be, uh, um, you know, have a role in this. And I certainly don't think judges should determine it. As I said, I've been accused myself of a judge who thinks he's a legislator. And I don't think that's a good thing, but I think all of the players in the criminal justice system have to play a role in legislation and what ultimately emerges. We have time for one more question, at least, uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, one question is, what do you think is the best way to assess individuals' ability to pay in a meaningful way uh, pre-arraignment? Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a tough issue. I think we have to, as a matter of course, be able to get the kind of information that we need with early screening um, and, and be able to get in front of the judge uh, the kind of data that tells he or she what to do. I think it's a critical issue. And again, I think it's early uh, 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 screening 
and getting getting that information without uh, being intrusive. But I think we can do that. Hey, Judge, I want to thank you so much for the time uh, you spent. And um, we're not used to doing webinars. We're used to having you in person. Uh, where we yeah. can all stand up and clap. But I, I really appreciate the time that you've given us. And I'm sure in speaking for all the all the attendees today, uh, they join me in wishing you well. Um, I hope you'll be able to stay with us for the rest of the conference if you can. Uh, we're going to cut off for another five or ten minutes as you move into the next panel session. But thank you again, Judge. And Oh, thank you, Steve. My appreciate. pleasure. Delight to be with all of you. Let the dialogue continue. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to move into our next uh, next part of our program. Uh, we'll go on a break for about five minutes while we get our panelists together for the next session. Thanks, everybody, and stay with us. <laughs>